When you reap your harvest in your field, and you forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the main branches again. It shall be for the stranger, and for the fatherless, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command you to do this thing. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19 through 22. Well, welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study. My name is Carl Luther, and this is KDL Ministries. You know, God's law was very passionate about taking care of the stranger and the fatherless and the widow. He reminded Israel that they once too were slaves in Egypt. They knew all about oppression and what it was all about. And they were told not to oppress those in their society who were less fortunate. It's just the reality of the world that we live in that not everyone's going to be prosperous. There will always be those who have and those who have more, and those who have less. Jesus even testified this himself. This is what Jesus said. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. Matthew chapter 26, verse 11. In our story of Ruth, Naomi and Ruth were certainly two women who would have fallen to the poor class. Let's pick back up in chapter 2 and let's see what we can learn. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Eli Melech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So just for everyone's understanding, per the law of Moses, this thing called gleaning, that was the right of the poor. And what does it mean to glean anyhow? Well, during the harvest season, there were reapers and there were gleaners. The reapers worked for the landowner whose crop it belonged. The gleaners were that class of people like the stranger and the fatherless and the widow. They followed directly behind the reapers and picked up what they missed or whatever they dropped. And the laws of Moses was clear that you were not supposed to go back and get the bundle of grain that you accidentally left behind nor were you to repick the olive trees, nor glean the grapevines. These belonged to the poor, and the righteous man who abided in this law, God said he'd be so blessed, he wouldn't even miss what was left behind for the less fortunate. So consider this law sort of a welfare program for the less fortunate. Continuing, picking up verse 3. Then she left and went and gleaned the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Eli Melech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Now I told you last week in our story that Naomi represents Israel and Ruth represents us, the Gentile church. So look through your spiritual eyes again. Ruth, a Gentile who got grafted into Israel, is working in the fields. Now what does that sound like? Are we Gentile Christians not grafted into Israel? And are we not called to labor in the fields of the gospel? Listen to Jesus' prayer. Let's look at the gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 2. And Jesus said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to his harvest. The Gentile church has been laboring the fields for the past 2,000 years and has only rested a little in the house, the house of God. 
I'm telling you, this entire story of Ruth points towards the love of God towards mankind and his redemption, the redemption of the church. So just ponder that thought as we continue. Picking up in verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face and bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Okay, let's just go ahead and assign Boaz his character. If Naomi is Israel and Ruth is a Gentile church, who do you suppose Boaz would be? And if you guess Jesus, you're spot on. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer in the story. He is the Goel. And after the kindness that he's just shown Ruth, she falls on her face and says, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Now, can I even count the times that I've asked Jesus that same thing? <laughs> why, Lord, have I found favor in your eyes and why have you taken notice of me? If you're a born-again Gentile Christian, your cry should be also that of Ruth's. Continuing, picking up in verse 11. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has fully been reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you have not known before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. If ever there was an analogy of the kinsman redeemer as outlined in the laws of Moses, I believe we just now read it. Like Boaz will be to Ruth, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. As the Psalms says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Psalms chapter 91, verses 1 through 4. Again, we are akin to Jesus just like Ruth was to Boaz. And why? Well, because like Ruth, we have forsaken the gods of this world and we've made the Lord our God. We have sought refuge under the protection of His wings. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer because we've been grafted into Israel, unto the God of Israel. Do you really understand that concept? Without having been grafted into Israel, we are not of kin to the Lord. And let me say that another way. If you are not grafted into Israel, then Jesus is not your kinsman. Ruth is a perfect picture of that wild olive branch having been grafted into the main tree. That's what Paul says of us Gentiles. We are grafted into the main vine, into the family of God. There can be no other way. Now our redemption, our salvation, is not based on works, but rather God's grace towards us. Again, why, Lord, oh why, have you taken notice of me? God has afforded grace to me beyond measure. But we were created for good works. Paul said this about that. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And in our story, Boaz pointed out to Ruth, it's been fully reported to me all that you have done. <laughs> Always understand this. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Sow good works, not for salvation, but for your reward from God who sees in secret. Then he shall reward you openly. Jesus' words, not mine. And Boaz tells Ruth, May God reward you for the love that you have shown towards Naomi since the death of your husband and how you left your mother and father and forsook your gods. Now, did Jesus not say something similar to this? I believe he did. Let's look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 28 through 30. 
Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. Continue, let's pick up verse 13. Ruth chapter 2, verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread, and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. John Cole, as kids, do you remember that song that we learned for one of those choir tours? It went something like, he brought me to his banqueting table. His banner over me was love. Now, as a young kid, I didn't realize that this was a rapture love story between Jesus and his bride. <laughs> it's all right there within the sultry writings of the Songs of Solomon. And Boaz tells Ruth, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So just for a moment, I want you to really look at this grace. Not just grace, but amazing grace. That's what's being displayed here. Here you have Ruth who's eating at the master's table. And first of all, she's a foreigner. Second of all, she's in the lower class of people called the gleaners. And now, and women don't shoot the messenger, but now, number three, she's a woman. And again, look at where she's been invited to sit. She's sitting at the master's table. Ruth is a perfect example of when you come to Christ and make the God of Israel your God, it doesn't matter what your social status is or was. You could have been a despised tax collector like Matthew or a known adulterer like Mary Magdalene. Or heck, just look at Paul. Before Paul was Paul, he was Saul, the church persecuting zealot until he came to God through Jesus Christ. It's just like my opening pre-lesson. Your sins have been taken away to the uninhabited place, the land of the Gazara. As far as the east is to the west, an amazing grace has been afforded to you. Again, he brought me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. Continue, picking up in verse 15. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. Now, that's about 50 to 60 pounds of grain. According to today's measurements, an ephah is equivalent to a bushel. And there's approximately 149 cups to a bushel. And the recipes for barley bread that I came across calls for three cups of barley per loaf of bread. So the gleaning that Ruth collected in that one day alone could have made anywhere from 45 to 50 loaves of bread. Now, one thing you should be aware of, the harvest season, it didn't last very long. And per the law of Moses, the reapers couldn't go back and glean the fields once they performed the initial harvest, right? So what's that tell you? The gleaner's work was very short too. They were like today's temporary workers. There was a short window of opportunity to gather whatever crop it was that they were gleaning, and the produce that they gleaned had to last until the next crop's harvest season. Now, I don't know what the average collection would have been in those days, but it sure sounds like Ruth hit the jackpot. Continuing, picking up verse 18. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name whom I work with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. 
<laughs> now I can already see the wheels spinning inside Naomi's head. She's aware of the laws of levered marriage, but she knows that she's no young spring chick. She even said so in her previous chapter when she said that she was too old to remarry and certainly past the years of childbearing. But Ruth, now she's a girl in her young prime. Continuing, picking up verse 21. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Okay, short lesson tonight, but I really want you to ponder this Old Testament concept and law of the kinsman redeemer. Remember, he was the next of kin to the person in question. Where there had been the unjust murder of a family member, it was the goel that took revenge. He was the blood avenger. Whether it was the unfortunate death of a husband who died without any offspring, it was a goel that stepped in and became the husband and father. Whether it was a debt that couldn't be paid by a family member who was about to lose their land, it was a goel that became the redeemer of land. Do you see how Jesus fulfills the law of goel? He's our kinsman that will avenge the death of all the righteous that's ever been slain since Abel. He is the avenger of blood. He's our kinsman that's become our husband and father. We are his bride, yet we've also been adopted into his family as sons of God. He's our kinsman that's paid a sin debt that we couldn't repay. He's become our redeemer. I just can't emphasize enough how rich the laws of Moses are when they're applied through spiritual eyes. It's simply amazing to see Jesus throughout all of the Old Testament. Okay, next week we should finish up the next two chapters of Ruth and fully see the laws of levirate marriage and the law of the kinsman redeemer in action. Until then, stay safe and I'll see you all next week.